put a, a, a permanent ramp in. So that could work under certain circumstances. In a situation like that, putting a big bell out front lets someone alert the staff inside that they need help. A um, couple of other comments. Generally, the standard is that a, a transition should be no more than a quarter of an inch or a half inch if it's beveled. What some people have done is if they have just a little bit of difference, they build it up with cement, and that usually starts crumbling very quickly after that, so it, it becomes more of a trip hazard. You see the problem here. Uh, here are some other examples. If you have two different types of flooring that adjoin one another, that can be a trip hazard. Uh, if you do something like this, I'm not saying it's correct because you need a landing there, but the fact of the matter is consider uh, making it a different color from the rest of the pavement in case someone has uh, visual difficulties. There is an example of a trip hazard. Unsecured floor mats, we've seen hundreds of claims on these. They either need to be secu fully secured, embedded, or simply removed. If you remove them, you may have a slip and fall risk, so consider securing it or embedding it. Uh, there's another trip hazard. Um, the re you heard me talk about landings a minute ago. The reason landings are important, there's actually two reasons. One is going in to this business. If your wheelchair is rolling backward and you're trying to open the door, it makes it many times more difficult to get in. Coming out, as you can see, there's, uh, um, there, there's all kinds of things on the door so it's dark inside the business. You come out into the sunlight, the landing gives you just a moment of level before your wheelchair starts flying in a direction, and that's exactly what would happen at this door. Uh, there is an example of how the landing is important to let someone get their bearings before uh, the ramp starts uh, taking them someplace. Uh, every business in California needs to have at least one braille sign. It may need to have more than one braille sign. In California, we use grade two braille, so a lot of people buy braille from you know, some company in the Midwest or overseas, and it's not the braille we use in, in California. Uh, this accessible sign should go at the front door. Uh, it should be on the wall, uh, 60 inch center line above uh, uh, the floor on the latch side. That's where someone who, uh, 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 we have lots of seats up front, if you want, guys. Um, that's where uh, someone who uh, does, can't see is trained to feel for it. So you can put Braille signs anywhere else, and, and it, it may be of no benefit. But that's, that's where it needs to be installed. Uh, if you have public restrooms, then you may need more than one Braille sign. And as you can see, for those, you actually need two signs, one on the door, one on the wall. Uh, if they can't see it, it doesn't count. One of my clients had this tiny little, uh, we, these are called ISA for International Symbol of Accessibility, and had the sign, uh, it was down behind the handle or a, a child standing in front of it could block it. It needed to be up here and obviously needed to be bigger. It should be, the, the wheelchair symbol should be six inches by six inches. Door pressure <coughs> is extremely important uh, the fact of the matter is you, well, you want to have less than, if it's not a fire door, you want to have less than five pounds of pressure to open the door. In layman's terms, that's a really light door. That can be a problem with certain air conditioning systems. You can actually use a fish scale to approximate the measure, uh, but the fact is that there are devices that you can buy on the internet that, uh, that will let you measure it more accurately. If your door is too heavy, it may not be a problem. You can, uh, there are often screws under here and in these aluminum frame doors, they're at the top of the door, uh, and sometimes just adjusting them will, and lubricating it will improve the pressure. Uh, in a situation like this, this building had some historic architectural features, and these were narrow heavy doors, so they put in an opening mechanism, and that was a good solution. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that you can't have anything that, that someone might have to touch that requires t pinching, twisting, or grasping. So a round door handle or a uh, squeeze type door handle isn't going to work, or one of those arrangements that you sometimes see at filling stations where they give you the key on a coat hanger, that requires pinching, twisting, or grasping. 
the classic lever style eliminates that problem, and there are some other examples of compliant hardware. Uh, a lot of companies say that their product complies with the ADA, yet I continue to see lawsuits about items like this. Like in this case, you'd have to twist that manual door lock on the inside for privacy. That's not going to cut it, nor would the, the key. If you have a problem, you know, if you need to secure a restroom at the back of your restaurant, you can have a code, you can change the code every day if you need to, but you can't have something that involves pinching, twisting, or grasping. It basically, the test is, if you just had a stump here, could you operate it with no hand? There's your test. That's how to know. Uh, I'm going to pass over this, but there is video. Uh, you know, is your doorknob a hate crime? Uh, the, the statute that you heard me talk about that uh, involves the $4,000, we've actually posted the video where the legislature, the, legisl the author of the bill said, this statute is about hate crimes and discrimination <clears throat> crimes. That statute is now what's being used against businesses like yours for an unsecured floor mat or a sign that's blue instead of black and white. And uh, we believe that was not the intent of the legislature, but the judges say if they won't change it, uh, the law is the way it is. Uh, we suggest a 16-inch kick plate on the push side of all doors. The reason for that is that uh, Sometimes if there's protruding objects, a wheelchair can get stuck in a hollow core door. The foot pedal of a wheelchair that's used to open the door could actually puncture the door and someone could be trapped. Uh, obviously, you know, with a glass door, uh, the concern is that it, it could be broken if, if someone didn't have the ability to control a motorized wheelchair. You oh, hold it. You generally need 32 inches of net clearance at a door, which means with the door open 90 degrees, do you have 32 inches? If you don't, uh, it may not be fatal. There are things you can do. Number one, if you see a, a, a piece of door hardware that looks like this on your door, on the inside of it, you may only have 31 and a half inches. It's just there were thousands of these doors built. Uh, and uh, if you take this off and put on a handle like this, you may be able to improve your, your clearance. So you may not need to replace the door. If you have doors like this, and they're just too narrow, you can, you can replace it with some aftermarket units that involve, say, a 36-inch wide door with some side lights. Other things people do, they can put the door on offset hinges uh, so that it folds back flat. There are a lot of different things that, that can be done. Uh, it's very important to keep in mind that on either side of a door, uh, you need to have what's called strike clearance for a number of reasons. Wheelchair, people who use wheelchairs often don't go in a door at 90 degrees. They approach from a certain angle. Some people don't have complete control over their wheelchairs, so you need to have a little bit of room so that they can miss it a little bit. As you see here, uh, these planters had to come out to allow about 24 inches on either side, and here, uh, by, po by putting this uh, piece of video equipment here, this game, uh, if there was an emergency, it, it could be difficult for someone to get out in a hurry. Uh, okay. Oh, emergency exits are a growing group of claims. Uh, be sure that your emergency exits are wheelchair accessible. Uh, we talked about unsecured floor mats, but here also look at this path between the floor mats and the doors, someone with a wheelchair couldn't get through there. Uh, some manufacturers claim that their mats are, are ADA accessible, and I think things with the beveled edge are certainly helpful, but we're not aware that there's, the, I, I'm not sure that, that that is the case. The very best solution is if you can use an embedded grate like the one you see here. I've actually saw someone in a walker trip over a, uh, a floor mat right in front of me. Uh, okay, now let's talk about the interior very briefly. Uh, you go on ADA.gov, you'll hear a lot about 36 inch aisle clearance. California requires 44 to 48 inches and maybe more in some cases. Uh, we think 48 inches is a very safe clearance. Keep in mind that the general public will often move items about so you probably want to have someone check, maybe walk through with a yardstick. Uh, 
one or more times per day. Uh, but at the very least, if you have anything less than 36 inch clearance in any aisle, consider rearranging your displays or, or something. Uh, as you can imagine, if, if you were in a wheelchair and you needed to get out in a fire, things like this could uh, be absolute barriers to you, especially if there was smoke. Counters under the 2010 standards are going to be an increasing source of claims. Uh, one of the new requirements is that in some cases, you may need underside clearance for the wheelchair user's legs and the foot pedals. Uh, you may not need it in all cases, but we oversimplify. We suggest that you put it in. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute of a counter that a client of mine did for less than $100. It solves the problem beautifully, and uh, it's certainly never worth a lawsuit. But before I do, just a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, this is the problem. This was a, a lady in a wheelchair who graciously offered to demonstrate that first of all, it's a dignity issue. You feel like a little kid. You, you ought to be able to look the, the cashier in the eye. And some people with shoulder problems couldn't lift packages to that height. Uh, you see counters like this all the time, and that's going to be a problem. It needs to have underside clearance like you see there. Uh, this doesn't have appropriate underside clearance. You see a lot of flip-up counters. The problem with that is that you are potentially putting your financial resources at issue if you use a flip-up counter. Uh, the deal is if you have a counter, like here's the one that we point to. This is the one I was telling you about. My client did this for 100 bucks. Most retail businesses have display cases or something that you can put a flip-up counter in. Staff flips it up to walk through. They, you know, it drops back down so it is normally in position. It is normally a compliant perfectly adequate alternative. Just one second. Uh, so if you have a counter that flips up, but it's normally in place, that's fine. If you have a counter that's normally out of place and flips into position for use, you're saying, I can't afford to do a, a compliant counter. And so the plaintiff's attorney will then say, then show me your books since 1992, because I think you did have the money to, to put in a compliant counter and you don't want to go there. It's never worth it. Sharon, did you have a... Yeah, on the counters. Mm -hmm. If the counter is purely cosmetic, in other words, like at the restaurant, when you go in, there's a huge podium where the, the, all they're doing is the, the girls are just cleaning menus and taking names. There's no register. There's nothing that actually has to be... Right, that's like a reception counter in right. customer service. A exactly. Is that now something that has well, to be... I, I would do it because we deal with such nitpickers, people who are really looking for an argument. More How about than, bars? Uh, I would do it. You need to, In a bar, you need to have a 60-inch. Well, I mean, if there's no chairs. If it's just well, a bar. Tell oh, you, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, Philippe, go ahead. Yeah. I'll let you do this. Getting back to the hostess stand, if you have any uh, items that are there to be taken, like perhaps a menu or business cards or any kind of uh, to-go menu, anything like that that anybody could reach and take, then yes, you should have uh, either they should be mounted low on the front of it with uh, display bins uh, or have a section of the counter that's lower so that somebody in a wheelchair could reach those business cards or menus as well. Okay, that's even at the hostess stand, even though you're not, you're not transacting business there. If you have any kind of uh, handouts, you need to have those mounted low. Or just pull them down. Or get rid of them, <laughs> absolutely. Get rid of them. Yeah. Uh, and then with the bar, David's absolutely correct. Even if it's a walk-up bar, you just like the lady who was uh, barely able to see over, you need to have a section of the bar uh, depressed or lowered to... So just about every restaurant in this state is, is not compliant. compliant. Absolutely. Because I, I never see a, 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 a liquor. Especially if they were, love that. Yep, yep, that's it's like easy time pickets. employment. I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> obviously been no that's good. correct. However, I want to I want to keep yeah. moving. Okay, right. got, uh, by the way, guys, would you like to see you? I'm going to be standing oh, in front sure. of you way too much. And did you have a question? I did have a question. Is that uh, counter related to all things or just service or is there some special provision for uh, document signing only? Uh, service, well, first of all, like, like transacting if, goods. If you're eating, just... if you're buying goods, if you're signing documents, those standards and those numbers right there, uh, those apply to everything except we talked about, you know, if, if there is a food service situation, 
uh, where someone might be eating, and I'm telling you if you disagree with this, if someone might actually end up eating or drinking at the counter, then uh, this 36 inch wide goes to 60 inches. Um, the idea is, I, I'm sorry, I missed the first part, if that's an eating counter? Yeah, like if it was a bar. Yeah, 60 yeah. inches. Then it's 60 Maybe, inches. Okay. Theoretically, because of a companion. Right, right. The, the idea is simply that they need to be able to pull their legs under. Now, there is an exception, but I don't want to take the time with that. And the reason I don't want to get too detailed is because, sure, if you can pull up alongside a, a counter, some counters, in some cases, you might not have to have the underside clearance. The problem is, if we spend time talking about that, and then you put a display next to it, so someone can't pull up next to it, then you've got a lawsuit. If you put in the underside clearance at all counters, it's just so much better. So once again, for 100 bucks, problem solved. Uh, this is an increasing source of claims. Uh, people are claiming that uh, there wasn't a, a wheelchair, uh, there, there wasn't a register open for people with disabilities uh, at all times. Uh, and you know, you get into register receipts to document that one was. Uh, having a sign suspended from the ceiling uh, reflecting that this, uh, this register will be open for people with disabilities can uh, help tremendously. Uh, reach range is a big issue. There is no limit under the ADA for how high you can stack products, but please keep in mind that any, you know, really anything over about uh, 48 inches uh, and even lower in some cases, may be out of reach for someone in a wheelchair. So this, these signs, these assistance signs are great. There is no requirement, but uh, I, would, I, would, I would post a sign like this so it almost hits you in the face, and just so it's very obvious at the front door. And then if you have high displays like this, I would, uh, obviously, if you can make them equal access, all the better. But if you feel that it's gonna, create a financial consequence to your firm, then uh, I would definitely post assistance signs anywhere someone could take a picture. Uh, we talked about uh, tables. Hold on, that's the arrow I want. Um, number one, I see a lot of tables like this and, and pedestal tables. Those will interfere with the foot pedals of a wheelchair. I showed you on the counter page a, a card table. Just go to a thrift shop get a large folding card table with four legs. Believe it or not, that can be perfectly compliant. Now there's a, a nicer model. One thing to keep in mind, I always see the ISA sign on the face of the table facing up. You may not be able to see that from a wheelchair. What we suggest clients do is get one of those acrylic menu things, glue it to the counter, you know, have it sit up vertically, then you can see it from a wheelchair. And by the way, we suggest, and the 2010 standards, I think, uh, support this, that if you have a restaurant with a bunch of tables, try to have your staff seat the, uh, the wheelchair accessible tables last. So if someone in a wheelchair does come in, you more likely than not have it available. Uh, okay, we talked about that. Self-service devices. Another new issue under the 2010 standards is the highest point that someone can reach used to be 52, 54 inches. Now it's down to 48 inches. So a lot of vending machines need, you know, you need to consider replacing them. People will say, well, but if it complied with the 91 standards, great, but the odds are, if I were to go in your business, there's probably one thing that didn't comply with the 91 standards. So they would suggest that uh, you now need to meet the 2010 standards. And once again, do you want to deal with a lawsuit on that issue? Other things like video games, you can post all the assistance signs you want. You can't have your employee play a video game for someone. This should be on a, a table so that someone in a wheelchair could, uh, uh, could play it themselves. Things like this uh, often require pinching, twisting, or grasping, and probably should be removed. Uh, things like this, one solution we saw, number one, do check your door pressure because as these devices age, they get harder to open, but sometimes they can just be lubricated or, or refitted a little bit. But, you know, these items on the top shelf typically aren't going to be reachable by someone in a wheelchair. An assistance sign is good, but what I think is better, 
one of our clients put an assortment of every item in the display down on a low level so they could be seen by someone in a wheelchair so that there would be equal access to it. Uh, consider the viewing angle of someone in a wheelchair. Uh, this keypad was a, a new item and it faces up and away. As you can see, <coughs> this is a, uh, a cash register. They had an assistance sign, but it was pointing up towards the ceiling. You want to think about where someone in a wheelchair would be uh, situated and what their viewing angle would be. Also, there are certain minimums for font size. If you're going to have a sign directed to people with disabilities, then uh, I think you want at least a 5 eighths inch font, maybe higher in all cases. Uh, we're getting close to the end. Uh, restrooms are an increasing source of claims. We, there's about 100 different measurements that are relevant to whether your restroom complies. We're not going to go through all of them, but here are some key lawsuit flags. Number one, you need to have a sign on the door and on the wall next to it. It needs to be the right sign. As you can see, it could be men's, could be women's. If it's wheelchair accessible, it needs to have the wheelchair on it needs to have grade 2 braille. Uh, there are different signs for the door as well, depending on who it's intended for. Um, the dispensers generally should be, anything someone might have to touch should be no higher than 40 inches from the floor. Uh, same with the uh, lowest reflective surface of the mirror. This mirror has a bevel, so uh, as you can see, that, you know, the you don't count from the frame, you count from the bevel. Uh, coat hooks, we're seeing, I litigated for 17 months on a coat hook, uh, about $100,000 worth of work. Now we won, but no, you, you don't have, you, he's correct, no we didn't, nobody wins in a situation like that. Uh, if you have a high coat hook, just put a low one down there. Uh, oh, one more thing. Uh, in the old days, before this law that I told, the new law, uh, SB 1608 that you often hear about. Uh, we would show a picture of this restroom and say, how much is this room worth? The answer was, I think, uh, $24,000 based on $4,000 for the uh, paper towel dispenser that's too high, $4,000 for the mirror that's too high, $4,000 for the soap dispenser, $4,000 for the other paper towel dispenser, $4,000 for round faucet handles, $4,000 for unwrapped pipes, and 4000 for a pedestal sink. Uh, under the new law, the whole room is worth 4000 And look, all of the items that I talked about, probably most of them could be fixed for $100 or less, sometimes just repositioning a little bit. Uh, automatic devices can help tremendously, provided they're good quality and they work. So consider those. Uh, that way you don't have someone testing the pressure on your, your faucet to see if it's five pounds or less. Some, a lot of my clients have metal partitions, and you know, we talked about the turning radius, the 60 inch turning radius that someone in a wheelchair needs to turn around. Well, you need to have that in your restroom. Some of my clients have it, but they've got these uh, metal partitions. You know, sometimes you can take those out and you'll have it without having to move a wall. Some of my clients are moving walls. Um, Many, many times, you know, we suggest these wall-mounted uh, paper and trash cans. I'm sorry? Recessed. Recessed. I don't want to suggest that people move these over by the toilet and take a picture. Uh, but uh, I have had a number of claims. And, but if, if you think about it, if you were in a wheelchair and you needed to use the restroom, you shouldn't have to pick up and drag this germy trash can away from the toilet. <laughs> My point is, take that claim away, just put one of these things in the wall and it's never going to move. Uh, restroom sinks, among other things. Uh, oh, cabinet style sinks, can't do it. You've got to have the, uh, uh, the, the underside clearance for legs. Uh, also, when you do put in an ADA style sink, the pipes need to be wrapped as well as the hot and cold water supplies and any sharp objects under the sink because their legs need to go under there. You also need to have clear floor space near a sink. The reason why I suggest you wrap the hot and cold water supplies, the concern is that someone, uh, uh, they, their, their leg could actually get scalded. Some people who don't, uh, uh, 
who, who use wheelchairs don't have any feeling in their legs, and so they don't, they wouldn't know if that was happening. Uh, the reason why we suggest you wrap the hot and cold water supplies is, uh, in one case I know of, there uh, was no hot water heater in the building whatsoever, and they still got sued for not having their pipes wrapped. Wrap them. I, you know, the problem is people vandalize these things, people steal them. So not only would I wrap it, but I would take a bunch of duct tape and secure it. I would, I would make it very hard to walk off. And then again, we talked about uh, either an automatic faucet or something with lever style handles. Uh, round ones require pinching, twisting, or grasping. Uh, here you see a couple of things. Nothing should ever be mounted over the grab bars. Also, the screws that support your grab bars should be covered. Uh, you know, they have these flanges, but you could even put epoxy over them. If someone has to reach for the grab bar in an emergency, and I've had to do this with a member of my family in a wheelchair, when we're doing the transfer, you have to grab anywhere you can. And uh, I've, I've cut my hand many times on, on situations like this because they may also be using the grab bar. And so just cover them up. Just, you know, if someone gets injured, that, that's needless. Um, toilet paper dispensers should protrude less than four inches from the wall and should be uh, at, at least, 50, nothing should be lower than 15 inches above the floor. Because again, someone in a wheelchair may not be able to reach that low. Um, a couple of other notable things, the uh, flush handle should always be on the side opposite the wall. Sometimes you can fix that by just switching tanks. Uh, here you see a situation where the toilet was too low. I think we give you the measurements here. The center line on the toilet needs to be 18 inches from the wall. The seat height needs to be 17 to 19 inches. If it's too low, you can add these aftermarket products. If your toilet is off center line, they have these flanges that will shift it by up to, I think, an inch and a half or more in some cases, uh, and your plumber can put those in. So here are the measurements that I was uh, showing you. And there are other ways uh, to reduce the risk of lawsuits. Uh, I love showing this picture and sharing uh, well, you'll, you know whose office this is. This is a guy who uh, uh, filed at least 700 lawsuits, was the scourge of Southern California, and uh, for some reason, it was important to him that I come to his office, and he wasn't there <laughs> for when I showed up. So my assistant and I took out our camera phones, and we found 41 violations, uh, and they've been posted on the internet. Uh, even some of the legislators who voted against these, these bills, we've gone to their offices, and they have the same conditions on their property that my clients are getting sued for. So um, very briefly, because I know we're over time, I want to talk about the new law. Uh, well, let's just go through this really fast. Uh, and it's in your notes, so I'm, I'm going to rely that you look at these later. Uh, if you've not yet been sued, regularly photograph all over your property. Keep the digital photographs back up so you can document what existed at any particular time. Certainly before you make any changes, take pictures. We require all of our clients to retain a CASP inspector. We suggest you do it through a lawyer. There's important reasons for doing that. Most lawyers I know will do it for free. Uh, let's see. Uh, if someone, tell your employees, if someone hands you documents, there is no legal requirement to sign for them. People still do this. And the problem is sometimes there are deficiencies in service. Uh, 